Morning, all. Getting started a little bit late today, sorry. Snuck up time, snuck up on me. I guess uh, I'm just not used to the new time. I hate this time change thing. Yeah, I wish it'd go away. Uh, before we get started, I got an issue with Moodle. I don't know what the hell it's doing to me, but I try to work on my, the desktop here at school, and it gave me that stupid error I emailed you about last time about finished attempts and can't get in and all that. Then I'm <clears throat> working on my laptop, the one I'm zooming through, and I get in fine. So how in the hell can it give me two different pages from two different, I mean, Moodle's Moodle. How in the hell can it do that? <laughs> Tell you that. that. That is a crock because I need to be able to work on one and use the other one. That's that's totally messing me up. I don't. I mean, I rebooted and everything. I don't know what what's going on with it. That would probably be a tech question. I I I, I turn it on. I put gas in it. I change the oil, and that's all I know. <laughs> well, um, what's well? Let me go back over. Um, let's see. Hold on a minute. Um, when you go into it. Do it over here. On the one that's giving me the error, the dates are. Oh, what the? F make me a damn liar, you asshole! It's working. See, online and you, you unjinxed it. This thing screws me up when you're not around, like the mechanic. Okay, yeah. That don't make any sense because I got into it on my laptop, but then it and it shows the dates being wrong, which I don't. Moodle's got got, got issues. Jesus Christ. I couldn't tell you. I'm sorry. Well, I don't understand how the dates could be wrong. It was doing like uh, the Wednesday, March 3rd was when I started, which is, that's a week off. That's a crock. And then the other error is you get two attempts, no reviews, and it's showing uh, Tuesday, March 9th. Well, that whole error thing, it's whatever's causing it, it's a week off. But then, you know, when it's working right, it's like I've only submitted one and I didn't submit the second one. I went in and corrected all the ones I was fairly sure of that I got wrong, but I've left a bunch that, and I have some questions too. Let me get this. Um, there's no, a couple no, where no, which, which one? All right, okay, that's what I, I've got my notebook out. Um, the one I'm not sure about, on 38 with a psychometric chart, I don't know what kind of answer you're looking for. Is it a number or, I mean, I have no idea what the hell to type in there. And I'm assuming on the R value 35 and 36, you just want like a two digit number. Okay, now go back. What was the first question? Well, let me do, let me do the psychometric chart. What uh, number was that? That's number 38 which if you got a minute, I, I want you to do another example. I don't remember how to hell do all that. That's, this is like Greek to me. <laughs> okay. It's like looking at a damn periodic chart. Okay, using the fall, a fall day, 75, 70 degrees, 50% humidity, what are the, how many degrees would it have to have to rapidly fall in order to uh, hit the dew point? Okay, so let's see. Um, I mean, you can work another one so I can figure it I'll, out. Yeah, I'll make up another one. All right. So first of all, I like to... Uh, Let me open that chart. I got it real big, too. Okay. The hell in images. Yeah, I downloaded it and printed it out nice and big. So, Because when you were showing the example in Zoom, God, I couldn't even see it. it everything's so tiny. Come on, you stupid ass. So what I'm doing is I'm opening this up in paint. So that's what I got. So I, I, you know, I went to this page and I hit print screen and then I go over to paint and I drop it in by, by means of control V. Right, right. Yeah, I know how to do all that. I, okay. Yeah, I just don't know, remember how to read the freaking chart. <laughs> okay. So let's say, let's say for instance, that it is, uh, mm, well, let's see. It's 51 degrees today in, at my house right now. It's 51 degrees and it's 39% relative humidity. All right. So what's the dew point? All right. So basically that's what I'm asking. What is the dew point? Oh, shit. 
All right, so 51 degrees and 39% relative humidity. So I'm gonna go back over to paint. <clears throat> and I'm gonna find 51 degrees down here, which is right here. And I'm gonna draw me a line. Okay, so basically what you got here across the bottom is uh, degrees in Fahrenheit. Okay, yeah, that's the temps, all right. All right, the bottom of it is degrees in Celsius. All right. Okay. That's good. All right. These curved lines that you see is the relative humidity. Oh, all right. And 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And, and this one right here is the magic number of 100%. All right. So that is the dew point. And we may not be able to get to the dew point on here. So I said uh, it was 39% relative humidity. Uh, <clears throat> Damn, I had a bigger chart turned out. So here's 30, there's 40. So right there is about 39. So we can't reach dew point at this point. Uh, okay, why? Okay, hold on a minute. I'm trying to. I mean, it's going to, it, it's off the charts, what I'm trying to say. Okay. All right, so let's change the relative humidity. Let's say that the relative humidity is 70%. Okay. I'm gonna move this up to 70%. So I've still got 50 degrees, 51 degrees. All right, wait, 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 where's the 70? I'm, I can't, this chart's so damn, oh, okay, in the brown? Yep. So you follow that line. Follow this line down until it crosses over your- Oh, you're looking for the intersection. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. So now, where does it cross over uh, the, the the dew point line? Okay, and that's this line here. That's this this last curvature is a hundred percent. All right. So basically, where it touches that, I'm going to pull another line down, and I have forty degrees. See that? Okay. So how much it has to drop is ten degrees. Okay, so it's 51 technically here. Oh, 11 degrees, okay. Okay, so yes, your answer would be 11. Don't put in degrees. Okay, yeah, just put, yeah, I know, just put numbers. Yeah. Okay, I think I can handle that. Yeah, so that's what, you know, anytime that you have, um, you know, a, a question like this, don't ever put the units. And I'll go back through and check these by hand as well. Uh, to, uh, you know, to make sure that you guys haven't done that for sure. Okay, on 35 and 36, and of course, I found the table once you said how to look for it because the, the link's dead. It don't work. So... Works fine for me. Well, you know, you're you and I'm me. <laughs> it's not working right within Moodle. I mean, it's not... I don't know what's going on. Is anybody else having trouble with the R-value table? I did have some trouble with the first ones on the test. I had to go back to the main page to get the R value uh, table link. The R value table link on the test in Moodle is working for me. Hmm. Well, you got good juju. Okay. <laughs> um, Mark, you just need to drink less coffee, son. Ouch. <laughs> so the gap, that has, that has to be calculated in on that wall diagram. Okay, so in this case, what, what is the R value at the framing section? There's the key word, framing. All right, so you don't even pay attention to, to the gaps on this one. What you're looking at is what goes through right here, right through that line at the frame. Well, that's good. Okay, well. All right, so what passes through there is the exterior air, the outside finish, the okay. sheet the stud so when you get here at the stud you're going to calculate you know the r value of this two by four on the long side all right so if you're looking up here sorry if you're can i shut it and all those values are in the the table that they are yes they're all in wow. here so if you go down here to like do one of them just so I like the stud because i mean well it's always the long side usually yeah it's always the long side uh, construction materials, two by four, and you'll notice that it says the three and a half side. 
Right, that's the standard. Okay, so that would be 4.38. Technically, it's 4.375 because softwood lumber is 1.25 per inch. So if you do that, you know, use use the three point or 4.38, but just so, you know, just so that, you know, I'm quick. That rounding won't screw us up on the final answer? No, because I use the rounding too. Okay. Right, so 1.25 times 3.5 gives me 4.375. Oh, and so they just rounded off to two decimal points. And when I did the calculations for the answer, that's what I did too. So we just got to add up uh, one, two, three, four, five. Seven things counting inside and outside there. Just add those up. Okay, I got that. All right. So do that. Uh, Where are you getting seven? You got the you got the outside air. You got the inside of the outside finish, the sheathing, the stud, the drywall, and the inside finish. That's six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, stud, sheath, one, two, three, four. Okay, all right. And had enough coffee. Okay. Uh, on 36, what is the total R value for five inches? Man, I searched the internet for an hour and I couldn't find a, a specific answer. I was trying to find the unit per inch and I couldn't. Okay, here again, you know, click on that link right there where the U value or the R value table. Well, I got it printed out, so I'm okay. okay. Okay, so five inches of polyurethane foamed in place. All right, so go to the insulation materials and right down here you have polyurethane foam, polyurethane foamed in place and it gives you 6.25. So what's 6.25 times 5? That'd be 31.25. Uh, there you go. Okay, that's all right. I'm just, I don't know. You make it sound simple when you explain it. Then when I'm reading it, it's like <laughs> rain fart. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, um, the other one that I got wrong, and then I'm trying to. <laughs> 31, when calculating a natural air changes in a house, which meth, I don't remember you talking about any of that calculus looking crap. Okay. Uh, obviously, yeah. D, because I got it wrong. Uh, I, I tried to, you know, you know, search, 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 but I didn't find anything like that. I don't even know how to guess. I mean, I don't want you to give it to me, but just steer me somewhere I can, you know, use some logic and figure it out, because I'm I'm pretty good at Googling shit, so I don't I don't know what why I couldn't find it. Well, we went over it in one of the videos. Uh, so maybe what I need to do is load that one sheet in there. Let me let me go to something right quick. I mean, I love a challenge, but when I can't even find something to guess from, I'm like, well, damn, I don't know. You know, I, I don't want to waste four attempts. It makes me look retarded. It takes that long to figure it out. Let's see. Oh. Hang on. Okay, no, no. I just found the other one because I'm not sure about how to answer it, what value to put in there. Okay, so, uh, and I'll, I'll post this to where you guys can get to it. So in the video, what we talked about was uh, in the technical standards, when you get down here, in the minimum building airflow standards, how do you calculate? Uh, so you have, you know, you have to use either the airflow of the building or the airflow of the number of occupants in there. Oh, uh, yeah, I remember that. Okay, and you use the higher airflow. Okay. <laughs> So what would be your, you know, Where did I miss that at? I when calculating the natural air changes in a house, which method is used? Okay, so that's what you have to ask the answer there. Okay. Uh, and the Eric, I selected A first, and then I selected C when it told me A was wrong, and it did not give me credit for either of those answers. Well, that's because they're both wrong. Well, that only leaves B wrong. because D is wrong, so that leaves B. There you go. I mean, all right, so let's go back and read this again. So you have to do both calculations. You do the calculation of the building. You do the calculation of the occupants. And right there is your answer. 
Okay, so now let's go back over here. Wait, higher? The higher number between airflow B and airflow P. Yeah, but he said he, he chose C and he said it was incorrect. That's not C, that's B. Oh. So in fact, it, it, the correct answers are A, B, and C, but B is the most correct. Well, okay, yeah. so if you chose, if you chose A, all right, we don't know what, we don't know these numbers. We don't know what's higher. So if you chose A and, and, and the airflow P is actually higher, then this would be, so that's what I'm, it's, it's kind of a, a DOT question, a DMV question when you go get your driver's license. So the answer should be the higher number between the two. Well, okay. You're going to do both of these calculations to find out which one is higher. And that's your, and the, and the key word there is the higher number between these two. Let me point out something that I've learned with Moodle, obviously, is you have to, when you take multiple attempts, it flips them around. So that letters are irrelevant because it oh. changes it. Okay. It always does that. So you can't use a letter. You've got to memorize text. Thank. I don't it flips. think my, let's see, let me check something right quick. I don't it think it's to, they're, they're, it's to do that. It, uh, well, it does. Oh, it does. Okay. So yes, it is. Shuffle my choices. It doesn't. Well, I mean, by default, everyone's always done that. I've never seen it do it. The other well, way. it's an automatic thing. Okay. Unless you go in here and, and uncheck that uh, shuffle the choices, then it's, it's an automatic thing. It's standard. It, it makes you think. That's why when I take a, a when I do one, I go back and review, which you have to use Google. Uh, Firefox won't let you print. So I print it out, and then I've got the copy of, of the each attempt. And then, of course, and then I see how, because you can't go back and go by the letter. you got to look at the answer. Yeah, right. I will, uh, Danny, I'll go back and check just to make sure that it's, uh, that it didn't, you know, pick the wrong thing or, or, or count you wrong on that when you were right. One last no, that's all right. I, I get that you're asking that you know the difference between the two, and I I selected what you know the method I would use first, which was calculating the volume. And when yeah. that wasn't correct, I went to the number of people. But I okay. see where you you were looking for the higher number between volume and number of people. I've just I've always been taught not to use number of people because it's so variable, and just go ahead and use volume. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, you know if. <laughs> Unless you've got a family size like mine, generally airflow P does not even come into existence. But I, I understand what you're saying. So yeah, that's been my experience that number of occupants just isn't used. Okay, so let me, Danny, let me ask you a question here. What is, and I want you to, okay, so what is the R, what is the required R value in North Carolina? for roof insulation, for ceiling insulation? Yeah, I got that one wrong too. It varies. Uh, <laughs> okay, all right. I, yeah, I it does vary. I went to 30. <laughs> Neither of those are right because it could always be variable depending on your building characteristics or if you're doing you know, R value trade-offs for other sides of your house, et cetera, et cetera. You, know, you can get special dispensation for different R values in roof lines depending on what's available and if you add more R value in other areas of the house. Right. So the, correct answer, what's the, correct, the correct answer is not enough information. I was going to, I did 30. It was wrong. I was going to do 38 the second time. So that would be wrong. So the correct answer has got to be not enough information given to determine. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Now, I ended right. up on that after my second attempt. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to get it on. Well, I won't get on two. I'll probably, I want to get a hundred on three, but uh, I'm trying to narrow it. Now, question 29, the last one. What is a typical goal to set when calculating uh, ACH of 50? Well, that's vague. I don't know what the answer is. It's supposed to be numerical text. I mean, I could put pizza. It's a numerical. Well, we didn't know that. You put typical goal. You didn't say the answer is numerical. <laughs> so I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know what to put. So I just put a two-digit number. There was no way of knowing what I was supposed to put in there. OK, 
Okay, go back and go back and watch the video when I was talking about the ACH 50 on that. There are there are typical goals that we try to set, and th that is a, a numerical number. And so, you know, how many air changes per hour at 50 pascals are you trying? Are we trying to, you know, what 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 is a? No, I wouldn't say normal. What is a respectable goal to try to get to? Uh, you know, on a new house or when we're trying to renovate an, an existing house. Um, as much as I've put into my house, I still cannot reach this number because of the of the way that this house was built. Uh, it has, uh, you know, they didn't they didn't caulk nothing, they didn't seal nothing. Uh, it was built in 1966 originally, and so to get that type of air sealing. I would basically have to tear my walls out and I'm not going to do that. So I've done the best that I can on that, but there is a goal on that, uh, a numerical goal. So go back and, and watch that video on that. And so it's, uh, so it's between zero and 50, right? Cause you don't go higher than 50. <laughs> God, I hope it's not 50. I will, I will narrow it down even further. It's between one and 10. Oh, all right. Like it's, <laughs> I mean, I don't want you to give me the answer. I'm just like, I want to use some logic. Like, okay, what are you looking for? Right. Yeah. Uh, which video is that like, which video was that in? Should be on this one right here, blower door. Okay, all right, she's showing them where to look. It's either on blower door or air barrier, one of the two, probably blower door. Okay. Because I talk about ACH 50 in there. All right. Well, at least I know where to dig. It's like trying to find a, uh, a corpse, but you don't know where to dig the, you know. Right. Does anybody else have any questions on this test? Hmm. I think I got hope now. Or did Mark act, ask them all? <laughs> well, I, I chewed on this, or I was here all day. Well, no, for really long. Uh, CAD cam. Uh, one day I was here all day messing with it. By the time I got done, my brain hurt. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Well, let's uh, let's cover. And like I say, I've got to go back and check this. Let's let's go through this the non built non traditional building quiz. Oh, yeah. I think I got all those right except for one. I went, no, wait a minute. Now, like I say, some of these were close and they could be oh, uh, yeah. interchanged. I, uh, especially between uh, uh, the two marks, did uh, underground and earth sheltered. Earth sheltered. I, I guess I need to remove one of those two choices off since they are so close. And uh, again, you know, when you have answers like uh, one of the oldest building methods would be the, well, that's whoever, underground. whoever said one of the oldest buildings. In other words, it could be underground. It could be uh, earth sheltering. But like who said, said it? Who said it in the PowerPoint presentation? How how good were you taking notes when? So, you know, basically what I've done was when you guys were giving presentations, I took notes during the presentations, and uh, then I asked pretty much, you know, what what you guys told us. Well, it's the way you worded it. One of the oldest could be either or, but the well, old one of the oldest could be them all. No, because we lived in caves. I mean, the caveman was the first one, so that was that's history. All right. Technically not underground, but you know. Right, right. So it's like awesome. I say, I've got to go back through and check these by hand uh, to make sure because some of you guys did switch them out some and I went back and give you credit for that. I just haven't went back and done them all yet. And I will. I will do that. All right. So we don't need to do anything until you fix that. Just leave right, that alone. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait to bitch after I've got it done. <laughs> okay. Well, so, I had a question. 
Same with question number two. Uh, you know, some of these may cross over, uh, but, uh, you know, I tried to get it specific even more so. Uh, but, you know, even this, even this question here is kind of vague. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm making up this test off the top of my head and I'm trying to trying to make it as specific as possible. But then every time I make up a test, somebody proves me wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> I try, I try. You, you try to. I do. So, you know, in this one here, I tried to keep it as simple as, I, you know, as absolute possible. You know, this building method can also be used to build bridges. Well, which one is it? Um, bamboo. Bamboo. That's right. Bamboo. Now, we do, you know, you th so you guys, the way, Mark, the way you think sometimes, all right, so they get out there and they build this bridge and they put a, a uh, culvert in and then they put a little dirt over it and they run over it with a compactor. Is that not rammed earth? Yes, it could be, but you're, you're getting too far. You know, you, you're putting too much thought into it. Oh, uh, so anyway, I didn't realize this went, you know, one question at a time. I thought it'd give you a couple of questions at a time. I'm, I don't know. So uh, a species of wood, and that should have been a species of wood uh, that would be used in a courthouse. And so uh, who give us, who did the courthouse? Was that Trevor? Uh, you got me to lie. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, anyway. Yeah, that was me. Okay. So which one of these was it on his choice? And that was the Pacific Hue. Obviously, basswood would not be cool because it's porous as hell and, and lightweight. White oak is heavy as crap, but it is a uh, open cell uh, wood. And honey locust, if you want to take the time to cut that thing up, it's also an open cell wood. Uh, but man, it's hard as crap. Like concrete. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. One of these can hold up to 4,600 pounds in, in weight bearing load. Well, when I found the real answer, I was shocked. I'm like, dang, I would have never guessed that. Which one is it? Pallet. Okay. So in his, um, in his uh, PowerPoint presentation, he specifically called out that number as to the pallets. Yeah, I Googled it and found the same answer and went, damn, yeah. how is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> in, 19, in the 1960s, the blank was introduced by William Copeland. Uh, okay, I know I got it. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, whoever, mm -hmm. done, whoever done that, chime in and tell us the right answer. No, thank you. You're, damn it. I got that one correct. First time. Well, I mean, I You're really... Right. What? Yeah. Yep. There you go. Okay, that's what I was going to say. But I so another thing that you can do, guys, if you don't remember, copy that, put it into Google, and see. That's what all I do. Up. I wasn't going to watch all those videos over. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Google's for. Okay. There you go. Or Duck Duck Go. Horizontal loop, vertical loop, lake pond loop, open loop are used in this method. Uh. That's the geothermal. Okay, there you go. Yep. This is fire resistant, wind resistant, and fungi resistant. Shows you how good my memory is. I got most of them correct. Yep, great. That's what I was gonna say. Just... Yeah. Okay, guys, you, you gotta chime in. Don't make Mark do them all. <laughs> The umbrella house design is a blank house. That was mine. That's underground. If I got that wrong, you'd have to shoot me. <laughs> Can't get your own wrong. <laughs> the earth ship house started out as a blank brick out. Um, beer can. Beer beer can. can. Yeah, can. beer can. I think the bottle came second. Modular ponds are now being manufactured for this type of house. I would have never guessed it. Well, I didn't guess it correct first. It's concrete. Mm -hmm. 
size ranges from 100 square feet to 400 square feet in living area. That's Tiny. a no-brainer. That's a no -brainer. <laughs> This material is porous and less dense than its older brother. Lightweight concrete. The older brother gave that away. <laughs> Contamination is a huge concern when buying this house to build a home. Shipping container. Yeah, hazard chemicals. Yeah. The soda home office building is a combination of these two materials, pick two. See, straw bell and cob. Passive solar homes use blank to work efficiently. That's obvious, but physics. There you go, physics. Uh, I did see a lot of people saying the sun, <laughs> but remember that in a passive solar home, sometimes the sun can kill us, can make it too hot. So in a passive solar home, all physics have to be, you know, taken into consideration when uh, when building this home to keep it cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Image of the moon. Oh, and another thing, um, you know, when I when I talk about passive solar, when I talk about passive and active, so uh, you've, some of you may have seen this before. But this is a this is just a little uh, tidbit of information so that you can remember what's what. So passive begins with a P. So does physics. I ain't spelling that right, am I? P H Y S P H Y S. Uh, I, I'm sorry, guys. I hate that I can't spell. All right. And so active begins with AC. And AC is a type of electricity. All right. So if passive, if, if, if anything is passive, it uses physics to work. If anything is active, most of the time it uses electricity of some sort, whether PV or a uh, battery pack or something to make it work. So that's a good way to, to uh, kind of keep that in your mind. All right, blank has a lot of thermal mass. Adobe. Can be laid out like Legos. Oh, wait a minute. I, I was on the wrong test. Let me stop you for a second. Uh, answer 11 was concrete, correct? Mod 11? Mo well, yeah. Modular pods are now being manufactured in this type of house. Yeah. I put concrete and you marked it wrong. Yeah. I was wondering who's going to catch that. I was waiting. Well, I, I was on the wrong test. I had to go back and look. So that's actually the correct answer. What is? Concrete is the correct answer. It is? I thought it was. I thought it was earth shattering, earth sheltering. Let's check it and find out. Well, I remember Googling that. Look at oh. there, earth sheltering. Uh, so if you remember, that was uh, the other marks. Earth. I did find an answer that indicated they do concrete modular pods, which surprised me. I mean, that's As a matter of fact, he had one of these pictures in his, there you go. He had this picture in his, a similar picture in his PowerPoint like this. All right. So those are the pods that you can buy and then basically just cover them up with dirt. So that's our show. And that's, uh, this would also be called berming, would it not? Yeah, when you're just pushing the soil up around you it. put it over top of it, it's berming. Okay. K 
can be laid out like Legos. What looks like a Lego? Obviously not timber frame, radiant heat, or log. So it, the right answer for this one is an ICF. What is an ICF? Insulated concrete form. There you go. All right. If I had said, uh, so of course this would have probably given it away. If I would have said that uh, a company named this type of toy, Lincoln blank, what is it? Wait, you say, say that one more time. Toy manufacturer. Oh, uh, Lincoln Lord. There you go. Didn't have any, but my cousins did. I think they still make them. You ever play with the Rector set? The metal stuff? Let's not get, let's not bring sex into it. <laughs> All right, so this is a Lincoln Logs set. Yes, it is. Uh, Lincoln Logs was a toy that has been around for ever and a day, and it used simple little things like this. Uh, and, and, you know, people have actually built houses similar to this, only to have them rot down because they, you have a big old flat spot in here, so... Don't do that. Erector sets were a metal, a uh, bunch of metal pieces, flat pieces, and a screws and so forth. So, yes. I used to cut my fingers on them all the time because they yeah. so, weren't filed down or nothing. One con to building this type of house is shrinkage. You just mentioned it. There you go. Log. Got to take in shrinkage. Guy was the first architect to use this product for building. I got it wrong twice. Like Concrete. Lightweight concrete. That is correct. Yeah, I couldn't find that. <clears throat> I don't know why. A con to this building method is not good moisture climates. Earth bag. Earth bag. You sure about that? Straw bill. Straw bill. I think it's straw bill too. Let's see. Cowbell. Sounds like cowbell. <laughs> One thing about, okay, so in an earth bag situation, um, and, and if you'll remember, we didn't even talk about earth bags, but in an earth bag, uh, the, the soil is kept inside of a bag. So uh, moisture climates, uh, you know, hopefully we have, you know, kept the water out of that and put some sort of coating on that so basically an earth bag is kind of like building a dam you've got a bag you fill it full of so uh, a certain type of soil you don't want any organic material in there and then you just stack them up and then you can cover the front of it with some sort of stucco or something or lightweight concrete and that's the way those are built uh and, and also another another indication i if i put like on this case i put earth bag on there but nobody talked about it we didn't talk about it at all so it was it it should be you know that should be a red flag as to say well that's not going to be the, the right choice because i'm not going to throw something at you that's not that we haven't talked about what building method can be stacked to create bigger homes and multifamily homes that's a no-brainer <laughs> shipping containers have you guys seen that one picture uh on the internet of uh the trailer, let's see, hang on, stack trailer homes. This is so cool. Look at that picture. Oh, that looks like um, Ready Player One by Steven Spielberg. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but just looking at all those steps makes my knees hurt. So, but I thought it was, I thought this is, that's, somebody's got a really cool uh, artistic brain. <laughs> to do that but i thought it was really cool <clears throat> i bet that's where he got the idea from i didn't even know that existed yeah that's really cool a com uh, a combine helps build this house straw kind of no-brainer either also true timber frame homes use blank to hold them together eggs very good Timber framing can also be referred to as 
Post and bean. Peanut butter. One of the following is not an Earthship quality. Can an Earthship be designed to contain sewage treatment? Yes. yes. Is it use natural materials? Yes. Does it use the solar, wind, electricity? Yes. Does it harvest its own water? Yes. Does it use thermal, solar, and uh, heating and cooling? Yes. Can you make your own food in there? Yes. <laughs> Is it cheap to build, Sam? No. <laughs> no, not at all. All right. It's very labor intensive. What is an adobe brick made of? Pick all that apply. Sand, water, and clay. Sand, water, and clay. Oh, excuse me. Sand, water, and clay. Why do PV modules require little to no maintenance? No moving parts. There you go. A pallet home is impossible to make airtight. I got this wrong the first time. <laughs> I thought it'd be true, but it's not. Nope. You can make it airtight. Sure can. I guess that looks, that's what caulk and foam is for, right? That's right. Uh, drywall. I mean, we put drywall on the inside and do a, an airtight uh, method on that, then it makes it as, as well. Bamboo is as strong as steel. True. An earth ship is not a passive solar thermal mass structure. False. PV modules become more efficient at extremely high temperatures. False. Okay. They become more efficient at extremely low temperatures. When we uh, design these PV arrays, we have to uh, design them with the lowest possible temperature that uh, the area could get. So uh, one of the uh, one of the problems that Texas was having recently is they, you know, they've been designing all of their PV modules uh, for say you know, 30 degrees. And when it dripped down to what, 12, I think it was my daughter said that it was in Dallas, then uh, these systems are overloaded with electricity and were failing. They were basically burning their lines in two. They were popping breakers uh, because they were producing so much electricity. Okay, any question, any more questions about the non-building methods? Again, if uh, you know, if you feel that you have an answer correct, uh, and it's it's been marked wrong, let me know. Email me. Don't text me because I won't. I usually don't have my phone. I mean, I usually am not at a computer when you text me sometimes. So, uh, and like I say, the earth shelter. Excuse me. The earth sheltering and the underground are very close. So I got to go back and and tweak some of your answers on that. So. Any other Eric, questions? On the, uh, on the most recent test, the R value code questions that you had, like the one that you just asked me about the ceiling yeah. insulation, yeah. et cetera. Um, I know that in your discussions in the video, you um, in class, you talked about meeting the R15 requirement with an R13 <laughs> plus a 2R. Yeah. Um, it, you know, Based on the wording of that question, I I assumed that that was the answer you were going to be looking for was the thirteen point two or thirteen yep. plus two rather. Yeah. Um, but if you scour that building code page, it does not list that as an option first. It and it doesn't. It actually says thirteen plus two point five on the code. And so when I went and looked at it on the code, I said, well, the code doesn't say 13 plus two, it says 15 first, and then it says 13 plus 2.5. So maybe he wants me to just pick 15. Really? Hmm. That's interesting. I didn't know that. 
I found the same thing in the code. I was going to ask that same question as well. Okay. All right. And similarly, <laughs> you know, it, it leads off with R38 for ceilings and then says 30 in some situations. So that's why I, I led off with 38, got it wrong, went to 30, got it wrong again, and said, okay, he means there's not enough information. Tell me what you said again about the ceiling. Uh, where, where the R values are listed in the code, it starts with R38 and then says 30 is applicable in some situations. Okay, okay. Uh, so I, I selected 38 as my first answer and then 30 as my second answer and was wrong on both counts. Okay. I also um, found 38 in the code as well and was confused about that not being an option or that being incorrect rather. Okay. That's, that would have been my second choice, but I haven't submitted it yet. So. Okay. I also have one other question uh, for the same test, the R value test, but for question number 22, I feel like I specifically remember you in a lecture saying that it's the warm on the summer side, which no. wall is warm in the summer. Okay. Maybe I was mistaken on that. If I did, if I did say that I'm totally completely wrong. I had a brain fart when I, if I said that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I do, you know, I'm not perfect. I confuse myself every day. I probably part, part of getting old, isn't it, Hurley? Hell, I was doing that when I was four. <laughs> it was a trait that, you know, long, long gone, long been gone. Okay, I'll uh, I'll go back and I'll check those. Uh, so questions 10, 8, 9, and 10. I'll check that. Yeah, what, what really threw me there is is just trying to, I, I understand the R13 plus 2, but now the code has it listed as R13 plus 2.5. Okay, I'll make note of that, and I'll check on that for sure. And, you know, so. so if that option had existed, if, it, if D said R13 plus 2.5, I, I would have selected that one first. But I because you. they lead off with R15, I went with that one. Yeah, they like to change stuff up. I know uh, a lot of things in between 12 and the, the 2012 code and the 2018 code, I mean, they just deleted the whole sections. Oh, God. First time I saw that, I'm like, how am I supposed to answer this? Yeah. yeah. Building codes class. <laughs> yes. I, I've got to, I got to go back and fix that, too. You know, for me to read through the entire code, though, is is whew, the question, you know, basically when I put some questions up there like that uh, and, it, you know, a whole thing has been deleted. So that is what you're going to be faced with when you're when you're in the building industry. You're you know, well, can I can I do this? Well, I don't know. Let's look it up in the code. Well, it's been deleted. So wait a minute. What do I do now? Well, you can't just stop. You've got to find an answer. So you've got to keep searching uh, for the right answer on that, for sure. Well, whose decision was it to delete it? I mean, what's the purpose in that? The code council. So there is a there is a uh, there's a group of people uh, that come together, or they they you know they collaborate, mm -hmm. and they decide what codes uh, should be. So you know when you see a section like that that says, "Oh, it's been deleted." Whoop, wait a minute. That doesn't, that just means that it's been deleted from the residential code. And so they may be a whole different code. So, um, you know, so when you, when you start looking at stuff like that, then, uh, well, I didn't want the international code. I wanted the North Carolina codes to come up. There we go. So, you know, when they delete one section, they may have put it in a whole new book. Uh, I don't think we had, maybe we had an energy conservation code in 2012, but I can't remember. So, you know, you just have to go back and say, oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe they just took that out. Really, they should and say, instead of saying this has been deleted, it really should say, uh, please refer to whatever code it's in now, whatever book it's in now. So, you know, again, it's, it's you know, there's tons of, of code books. There's not just one code book. Uh, you know, if when we're talking mostly about residential code 
And, you know, when you get into, you know, this other stuff, well, like electrical stuff, it really doesn't address electrical stuff because the NEC does, the, the, uh, the electrical uh, national electric code, which is not part of the international building code. It's its own, it's, its own entity because it's actually part of the uh, electrical industry, which is, I mean, it, you know, so the NEC addresses homes, businesses, uh, the the poles that go up on the you know on the side of the road. The line, I mean, it's everything electricity. Uh, so you know, it's it's huge. It's huge. And then you've got the regular building code, which addresses both uh, residential and commercial buildings. So there's just tons of of codes <laughs> out there. So there was an energy code in 2012. You could the, one, the one thing interesting about the when you go onto their site, the older codes you see here where they're they've got the little red dot on there that says PDF. You can download the whole thing on a PDF, uh, and so uh, that's one of the things that I do. Is well, I I can search because I'm a member. Uh, the college pays for me to be a member and I have access to the, you know, to the premium views, which I can do searches and stuff on that. But if you don't have that, uh, a lot of times you can go back to the PDFs on the older ones and search through the PDFs a lot faster. And then you find whatever, you know, R3.12.4B.5 or something. And then you come back to, you know, the building code, the new building code, and enter that number, and and you can find answers a lot quicker that way. Especially you can compare the two: what's changed, what's not changed on that. But guys, you know what? You guys have it so easy because in the old days, uh, I didn't have this. I had, you know, I had an old paper copy. And uh, you, you couldn't, couldn't search it except with your eyes. You <laughs> couldn't Google shit. So you just had to <laughs> sit down and spend a whole lot of time. You know, <clears throat> who, who still has a world book encyclopedia? You know, I mean, that's, that's nuts. You know, we, we don't even think about a world book encyclopedia, which used to take up, you know, half of a bookshelf in itself. So. Okay, so let's move on and let's talk about uh, green. But you know what? I tell you what. Let's take some break, and uh, then I'll talk about green building stuff. We'll take about a ten minute break. Uh, come back at ten twenty five, ten thirty five. All right. Okay, guys. Uh, so I was, while we were on break, I was thinking about something. Uh, Danny was saying that uh, in the code, they have changed it to uh, 13 plus 2.5. So why did they change it to 2.5? Good question. Extruded polystyrene has an R value of five inches per inch up five. It has an R5 per inch. So if we were to use anything less than half inch, so half inch extruded polystyrene, then we would end up with well, 2.5. So what the code council is trying to accomplish is to get us to use a half inch piece of uh, extruded polystyrene on the entire house as a thermal skin, a thermal wrap. It's very vague. And, 
you know, so to think about that, one of the one of the contractors that I work for, <clears throat> he does the whole house in OSB so that he has, you know, strengthened it so that there's no racking. And what I mean by racking is so we have our our plates and then we've got our studs in here. And racking means that this can go one way or the other if we don't have something in here that, you know, is going to stabilize this, such as plywood. So if we were to really do the, you know, use the, if we were to use that thermal skin on there, that half inch extruded polystyrene, how would we keep this racking from happening? Well, it kind of goes back to the days before we had plywood. And by using uh, diagonal bracing rather than the plywood. And so at every corner, at every intersecting wall, we should have some sort of diagonal bracing. Now, there's several different ways that you can do that. You can do lead-in bracing. You can do the cut-in top. Let me just see if I can find some pictures right quick. This is what I'm talking about when I say racking. This is what we don't want to happen. So a triangle is the strongest uh, type of, um, of shape that we have. And so we do like lead-in bracing. So what does lead-in mean? It means that we go down this wall and we cut out just a little bit of lumber in here so that this can be... Um, attached to the side of the wall and um, it will be flush down through here. So we have to, you know, we have to basically cut out a little bit of the stud and cut out a little bit of this stud and cut out a little bit of this stud and put this in there. You Another notch way, it. What? You notch it. You notch it. That's right. Another way of, of doing diagonal bracing is, you know, doing individual pieces like this, which are again, time consuming, we don't have a saw on site that easily does this uh, steep of an angle on our studs. So plywood is the easiest, best, uh, fastest way of doing that. However, there are other methods uh, that are that oppose ourselves today, and this is the one that I'm talking about here. This is a metal T brace. And so basically we do, we're doing the same thing that we did here, except instead of making multiple passes with a saw through all of these, and then having to, you know, knock them out with a hammer, maybe taking a chisel, cleaning them up a little bit. Uh, and by the way, I used to sharpen the back of my hammer, the, uh, the, um, Claw hammer? The claw hammer, the claws. I used to sharpen the ends of the claws so that I had a chisel on my hammer. Uh, so, but, you know, by using this, all we have to do is take our saw and cut one little place all the way down, you know, just saw it out. And then this is nailed on uh, to each stud and the plate. <laughs> Typically, they, they call for a 16-penny nail at each plate, top and bottom, and then a 10-penny nail on each stud through there. I have used these. These are great. These are super strong. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive when you think about if you were doing this type of method and the manpower uh, and the time that it takes to put this in, this is by far so much quicker, so much easier. 
and uh, it's just you know, it's it's really really a simple easy method to put this in there. Now, once you have these in, and you can put several of them across the wall, then you can put uh, extruded polystyrene on it. Now, I, I have also heard. Let's see. So you just pop a ch uh, chalk line, right? Keep it straight. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, are they thing. aluminum or steel? They're steel. How am I going to look this up? Um, I have heard people argue with this again and again and again as well. All right, so let's say that this is an exterior wall and we're going to put this all the way around our house and then we're gonna put siding right on top of it. So technically I could, and this is, this is the folks argument. And I posed this to the, one of the, con, the, the one contractor that I'm talking about here. <coughs> Why don't he use those uh, metal T braces and put uh, extruded polystyrene all the way around his house and then put siding right on top of it. And you know what he told me? Because it's a security issue. What do you mean it's a security issue? Well, if anybody wanted to, they could just kick in the side and go in between the studs. Well, if anybody wanted to, they'd kick in that window. If anybody wanted to, they'd kick in that door. You know, for saying that somebody can kick in this wall and go oh. in the side of it, well, heck, there's a lot of easier ways to get in than trying to go through this wall. And most of his houses, he uses um, the concrete board, the uh, fiber fiber cement board, like um, hardy board on there. Yeah, like using bathrooms. No, 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 no. This is different. The, you're talking about uh, backer board, concrete tile backer board. What I'm talking about is, is a hardy board that's made of concrete. Uh, How is it different from the backer board? I'll show you. Well, it just looks different. It's built different. They got, I, when I was working with my contractor buddy and we're doing tile, I think the standard sheet on that was five by three. I'm like, oh, that's a queer dimension. Why, did they, why don't they make it like two by four, four by four, or, you know, why yeah. not standard? What you're thinking about is this. The, the backer board, yeah, it's a it's a weird size. Uh, Unless the five. Okay, so it, it comes in a panel, but what I'm talking about is you know it's well, you can also get this in a panel too. I'm not crazy about the look of it, but you know this siding is made of concrete. This siding is made of concrete, so it's it's a finish, not necessarily a substrate. What you're thinking about, like here, is a substrate. All right. And this is a finish and it works really well. And the one good thing is a lot of the houses that, that are being built uh, here in Western North Carolina uh, need to be built to prevent forest fires from burning them down. So we use this type of material rather than real cedar siding. Uh, I mean, you can imagine if you had this type of siding where you've got the you know the staggered shingle siding uh, if it were real wood then there's lots of little crevices for embers to hang on to and get them under but if it's concrete then it's you know it ain't gonna burn so that's a, a good option to use in western north carolina especially or california the problem is we've got so many houses out there today that were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that used real wood because we didn't have this product at the time. And, you know, they're burning down like mad because of, of uh, forest fire, wildfires. And the more population that we, that we get, in other words, the more populated areas are going to be uh, posed with more forest fires because we have the ratio of more dumb people uh, in all of that that's going to go out there and start a fire. And for instance, in 1985, 
uh, April 5th, 1985. We had a fire here in Burke County that just absolutely devastated the county. It, it, it burnt thousands of acres. Nothing like what they got going on out west uh, at times, but for us here in Burke County, it was it was nuts. And uh, it exploded, and I, I'm sorry, I was thinking that hopefully oh, there we go. So this was the Mineral Springs. This is Mineral Springs Mountain. And uh, so what had happened was we had a stupid fella that started a fire down here in close to the South Mountain State Park, River Road here. So the fire started here on Young's Creek Road. So I'm gonna put a... How far is that from where you are now? Okay, so uh, you see that you see that blue uh, dot up there with a house on it? Yeah. That's my house. Okay. okay. Where my cursor is is where the fire started. Now, at the time, just so you know, it started The fire started right here on the back side of this property. I owned this piece of property at the time. Okay, so I was on the uh, upwind side of the fire. It, 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 it didn't burn me. But when it took off, now I want you to look at this. So I'm backing out here. Here's Morganton. Here's where the fire started. And there's Valdez. Now, according to this little area down here that's one mile so one inch is equal to one mile so it, again it started here and it devastated the city of Valdez so it crossed over Mineral Springs Mountain here and took over Valdez but in the in the portion of this it scorched all of this area right in here and it didn't stop until it hit Lake Rodius. It must have burned for days. It burnt for four days the, on that particular day, the, temp, the relative humidity dropped to seven. And when he started, he started a fire, a trash can fire. In other words, he had a burn barrel. He started a burn barrel and then went inside and took a nap. We lost 27 houses. God knows how many cars. Thank God we didn't lose any life. There was no loss of life in that fire. Um, but now here's the kicker. Fred Aker was the guy's name. He was fined $50. 27 houses. 27 houses lost on this mountain. And he was fined $50. Ah. So that's that kind of gives you a sense of that. So people today have rebuilt on this mountain and they are using the uh, you know, this hardy board or concrete fiber concrete board, uh, fiber cement board rather, to, to build on. And, you know, if they're really smart and they still want to build in the woods, so you can imagine this house here is built in the middle of the woods. We don't want to cut down a whole bunch of trees to build our house. We don't want to look like some prairie uh, out in Oklahoma or something. We put tree, we have trees and we, we like trees. So, you know, there's ways to build so that, you know, we have fire protection. One of them is the concrete board. Another one is don't use shingles. Definitely don't use cedar shakes. And some of the houses up on Mineral Springs Mountain had cedar shakes. We didn't think about the, the relative humidity ever dropping to seven. I mean, that's unheard of around here. <coughs> use metal. Put on a metal roof, it is more expensive. Uh, and design your house to have less uh, nooks and crannies. Uh, you know, you still want it to be beautiful, but there are ways uh, to build so that the design does not have a whole bunch of nooks and crannies for stuff like that. But that, you know, in California, what was it, two years ago, 
they, uh, what was the name of that? There was a town uh, and a housing development. I can't remember. It. Everybody Paradise. lost everything. What was that? Paradise. 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 There you go. Paradise, California. That's right. It was Paradise. So a friend of mine here in Morganton had a sister that lived in Paradise. And here's what the kicker was. They had a house just inside of Paradise that they they had uh, that they had up for sale, and they had bought a house just urban Paradise, and so they were in the middle of owning two houses. They lost both houses. So the insurance company had a heyday with that. Uh, so they, I, you know, I still I'm, I'm sure they've probably been taken care of by now, but. I know for a long time they struggled. They didn't have a place to live or anything. So it was it was pretty sad. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about some of these techniques uh, in green building. And I'm going to start off with uh, advanced framing. So let's talk about conventional framing uh, versus advanced framing a little bit to kind of bring you up. <clears throat> Quick question, if I may. Okay. You mentioned uh, metal roofing, which it's come a long way since the old tin crap and it's colorful and solid and all that. The issue I have with is it's too noisy. I don't like the sound of rain or anything else falling on it. I mean, really? I hate that. I mean, acorns, all that's just, it drives me nuts. It's not natural for me. I mean, I'd rather hear the sound of rain on regular shingles or something else, but tin, the, the metal is just too damn noisy for me. So how would you, how would you remedy that in a practical way? If you want to use metal, you'd always have to soundproof it somehow. Yeah. Uh, so a, one thing that just comes to my mind is the underlayment that you would use on flooring. So when you put down, um, you have a foam underlayment. Let's see. Uh, laminate. So that would be like a soundproofing barrier? Yeah. So, you know, it rings because a lot of times it's, uh, well, the louder it rings is probably because it doesn't have any type of, uh, of backing on it. In other words, they just... Uh, Bare metal. Yeah. Uh, I'm having a hard time thinking here. Uh, Ferd. Roof. I mean, I would do it if there was a way to soundproof it. But, you know, so uh, what you might be dealing with is roofs that are built like this and yeah. then have metal on it, which uh, they do this because that metal will, uh, it will condensate. And uh, so you, you really need to put a, a waterproof underlayment under this so that the condensation will run out and down. So a lot of people do it this way so that when they put the metal on there, then it has an air barrier or an air space in here to allow air, air to come through here and evaporate the, um, the, um, the condensation. But in doing so, then you're basically you've got a great big bale you got a great big metal bale there and and yeah so i in our house we have metal roof but the metal roof is directly on uh the roof that it doesn't have these strips and so when an acorn hits it it's you know it goes thunk but if it were hit something like this it would go dong you know yeah. so it's an echo chamber yeah so by putting stuff like this down on the roof as an underlayment uh you know, it's kind of like, uh, I, I know you guys have probably uh, experienced this, cheap stainless steel sinks. You go to put a coffee cup down in it and, you know, it just sounds like this, you know, you, it sounds like you just put your coffee cup down in a 55 gallon drum because it just rings. The better uh, stainless steel sinks actually have an undercoating on it like you would find in a vehicle that deadens the sound so it doesn't ring. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, even if you use this, there's probably, it's still going to be, there's going to be more sound properties coming from the roof than it would be if it were asphalt shingles for sure. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I love it. 
Uh, my grandparents' house, when I was growing up, uh, <clears throat> it was uh, it was built. It wasn't even built this good. It had uh, it had uh, the stripping, the the furring strips on it, and then it had the the um, rafters, and that was it. You, you didn't have matter of fact, the house didn't even have insulation. Uh, the house was built in uh, 1904, I think it was. So it didn't even have insulation. And but I used to love sleeping in this house during a rainstorm. Oh my God. But now during a you know during a sleet storm or a hail storm, different story. So and you know, here living at the house, here where I'm at now, we have acorn, we have oak trees all over the place. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of a a funny annual thing that you know the war has begun. All of a sudden you're standing around and all of a sudden, bang, you know, it will scare the ever living snot out of you. And my shed is built that way. And uh, matter of fact, one of my friends, uh, Gus, he was uh, he was over here visiting. We were talking about motorcycles or something. And we were in the shed and uh, an acorn fell and I think he shit himself. <laughs> it was pretty bad it was funny as crap I, I've never seen this man jump so fast in my life but that was pretty good okay so let's talk about uh framing and so to understand uh the framing that we do today versus traditional framing you know in the old days and I keep saying about the old days, and the old days to me were not all that far uh, gone. And I mean, it's still, a lot of these are still practiced today. They don't change anything. And I'm not seeing what I'm wanting, so I'm just going to go over here to the whiteboard and start drawing. Was it you that diagrammed, <clears throat> what was this course, or maybe the construction course, to where they're changing the corner two by four design? to stay wood, but still drywall. Well, that's what I'm getting ready to show you now. Okay. All right. So let's look down on a corner. Corners were always problematic. And let me give you an example of that. So when we... Um, when we should now wait a minute. I just had per, there. We go. That's good in there. Look at this corner right here. So this is the corner of the house, and um, this is the corner, and you see this cold spot here. All right, you can see every piece of frame in here, oh. but then we've got this really cold spot, and notice that this whole corner is colder than the rest of the studs. All right, so it's a darker color. So what's going on here is when we built these, we have, so let's let's get our terminology here. And so this is called a through wall, meaning that the plate goes all the way to the outside. And then we have a butt wall, which butts into the through wall. So we have to attach these two walls together somehow or another. <coughs> so we would basically take a whole bunch of two bys and shove them together mm -hmm. uh, to end mm -hmm. up with. So, the, OK, so when, when I show an X, that means it's a full stud. When I show a diagonal line, that means it's blocking. So if I were to look at this from the side, I've got two pieces of wood that run all the way, and then I have blocking on the middle part. Okay, so this is open, and this is open. So then we would, uh, you know, we've got something and actually did that the wrong way. Um, go back, change that. What do you call it when you split a piece of wood? Um, ripping. Ripping. That's what I, you know, you're ripping. I had to do that a lot. All right. So in the very, in the very beginning, people started shoving these two together. And so 
what is this dimension here? What is three times one and a half? One and a half. Okay. So actually I've drawn this wrong. This should be out here a little bit. Okay. And then we, when we go to put our butt wall on, then there is a stud that we start with so that we can nail directly into this big massive mess here. Now, what difference does that make? Well, we have a lot of wood here and we have open cavities in here. So the framers, they're doing their best. They're trying to build this house so we've got, you know, we get the, the footings, we get the foundation walls, we get the floor, we get the walls, and then we get the roof. And that way we can kind of slow down a little bit and come back and do some stuff, okay? We've got it protected. It's called, uh, you know, getting it under the roof. And so then we can come back and take our time to make it better. So it's a rush. We're in a rush to get this roof on. So in the process, we put our, our plywood sheathing on here and we've closed up this spot here. So then the insulation company comes in and they start putting in insulation in the cavities. This little cavity here is covered on the outside and cannot be got to. That was terrible English, cannot be got to. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a huge open gap here in this wall. Okay, so now uh, it's summertime and the old sun is beating on this wall here like crazy. And we have, remember the three types of uh, heat transfer. We have radiation and that's what this here is. The sun's beating on this corner by, by radiation. And this heat is going to transfer through all of these materials into the house by means of conduction. Okay, so it gets this uh, hot, which gets this hot, which gets this hot, and then escapes into the room. And we have hot and cold corners. Because we don't have any insulation in here, it's an easy transfer uh, of heat through here. And this is problematic. Okay, this is huge, huge problems. I'm going to erase this and leave that one in place, and let's draw a new one. So there's many different ways that we can improve on our framing. Uh, so we can use less lumber. And it, to go back, this here gets even more complicated uh, if we use a two by six rather than a two by four, because on a two by six, it's five and a half inches from here to here rather than three and a half inches. So a lot of times you would see people putting pieces of plywood in here to increase this space out. And, you know, so that we can put our drywall on this side here, you know. So, all right, so we have, let me go back and we got three and a half here. We said that this was four and a half here. Meaning that we have one inch of space and if, if I'm getting anybody confused, please tell me. I have one inch of space between the edge of this stud and the edge of this stud. So if I were to put this piece of drywall on first, which is a half an inch, then I have only a half an inch of space here to nail the, this piece on, which is problematic. So people would put plywood in here to increase this out so that I didn't have to worry about which piece of drywall to put on first. 
If you did play, you'd have an inch. What's that? If you put the one on the left first, you'd have a whole inch. Then when you butt the other drywall, you'd still have three quart. No, you'd have a you'd have a whole you'd have an whole inch but either way. No, one inch take away a half is a half. You know what I'm saying if you put the one you've drawn vertically in there first, you've got the whole inch. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that that's thinking. You got to think. You got you know the drywall people. I promise you, drywall hangers don't think. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, they they are thinking, let's get this up, hurry. We don't give a flip. <laughs> and and to be honest with you, I have seen more drywall hanging people that have no concept of construction whatsoever. They're college students. Uh, it's, you know, it's a no-brainer. And they don't think if, if uh, you know, now, you know, the more professional companies, yes. Uh, but they're, you know, professional companies... You look up uh, drywall hangers or drywall companies, you're not going to find as many drywall companies as you would plumbers or masons or something like that. Because, like I say, now finishers are a different thing. It takes a skill uh, to do finishing, good drywall finishing, but it doesn't take a whole lot of skill to hang drywall. And so everybody and their brother is, you know, uh, can do it. You know, but they they can't do it right, and they're not going to think about it. So anyway, by putting this piece of plywood in there, then they increase this size out, and they've got a whole you know inch and a half in here, and they don't have to worry about this. Again, this is pre-thinking ahead of time, uh, and that doesn't always happen. A lot of times, it was just slamming a couple pieces of wood together and moving along. But as we have come into the new age of green building, then, you know, thinking comes into play and we think, oh, wait a minute, how can we improve this? How can we do this better? So over the years, we have come out, we've, we've you know, come become aware of such things and we're trying to do better. Where was that one? I see. There we go. So we end up with better types of framing methods. So here's that conventional corner and it had that big gap in here. This was a block of wood. All right. Here is the new outside corner, a three stud, uh, California. I don't know everything. Everything these days is a California. You got a California bed, a California king. You got a California hammer. You got a California corner. I don't know. Anyway, so this is you know the new way of doing this. Well, what if we built it like this? Drywall clip to hold drywall in place. I have been building. I have been been in the building industry since I was twelve years old, and I have yet to have one of these plywood clips in my hand. Uh, I can show you a picture of it. I never heard of them. How long they've been around now? A decade or more? Oh God, they've been around for a long, long time. But they're not used very often. So there gives you two different types right there. Uh, so it's just a corner, you know, and it's a metal piece. So you have to uh, you have to use a different screw to go into this metal. So in, in commercial buildings, all of the framing is done with metal studs. And so the people that do the drywall in commercial framing use different, they have different methods. They know how the metal works. They can screw into it, bam, 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 not a problem. And uh, it's, it's good. But if you get a residential uh, for a hanger that goes into the metal industry, he's going to have a hard time. There's going to be a uh, there's going to be kind of a learning curve going on there, so that he gets the feel of going into metal. So what I'm trying to say is, when you're screwing into wood, you hit the wood, it goes in. Okay, there's very little resistance on it. But when you go into metal, you have a little bit of resistance because it's metal and then it pops through. And like I say, you use a different type of screw in there that is very super sharp and will penetrate that. A lot of times they have uh, smaller, um, they have smaller threads on them 
because if you took a wood screw and put it into that metal, once it grabs that metal, it goes so darn fast and probably just sink through completely into the drywall. So, you know, drywall seems to be the thing that drives a lot of our building because it's easy to put into place. Uh, before it was, you know, we had plaster and stuff. So we've got this through wall, I'm sorry, we've got the through wall here that we end up putting, you know, just two studs in. And then we have the butt wall that comes in that has its own stud. And that way we can get in behind it and put insulation in it. <laughs> so now we have, we have this little area here that's a thermal bypass. For before we had a larger area that was a thermal bypass. By doing this method down here, we're moving this piece of wood to the outside. All right, so before we had it to the inside, and now we've got it to the outside, which gets this away, we have less thermal bridging. It seems so simple, you think we would have come up with it a lot sooner. People didn't care. You know, when gasoline was 10 cents a gallon, we would drive all day and didn't give a flip. Okay, so over here we had we had all of this area here as a thermal bypass. On the outside corner, we can we have this area as a thermal bypass. But down here because we've moved this piece to the outside, it actually helps with two things. One thing, you know, if we were to frame in here and we were to start with, say, a trim piece, then when we go to put our siding on, we have nothing here to nail to. Over here, when we put our trim piece on, we have something to nail our, our siding to. But over here, we don't. By doing this method, we put our trim piece on. Then we still have something to nail our siding into on both sides. And now we have a very small area and a longer travel, which is also in a 90 degree. So, you know, we have a small area here that's going to transfer heat from here to there and then a small run through here. So a lot of this may be lost, but we're gonna, you know, this area here is where we're gonna have the radiation hitting and transferring that heat indoors. So it's a much smaller area there by using this, this metal clip on there. Again, in all of the years that I've been in construction, I have yet to hold one in my hand and I have yet to be in a house and see one used, period. The Lowe's here in Morgan don't even sell them. I've asked them several times. They can order them, but they don't, they don't sell them. So that kind of gives you an idea about that. So let's keep going here. So let's talk about the T. That's still talking about the corner. All right, so it's time to draw. You just like drawing. Well, I can't talk, you know, I'm glad I got this fixed because by God, I was, I was in tears the other day because I couldn't draw. <laughs> All right, so what is a T? A T is just that we have the uh, the exterior wall and we have an interior wall that is intersecting this. So in the past we have we come to this and we build these T's before we put them in the wall. Uh, so a rainy day would be spent building T's and corners and having them ready. All right so this is all full studs and you know, then you've got your own center spacing going through here. And a lot of times that would be 16 inches on center, which was the common. 
We go to put our sheathing on. Bam, we have just closed this hole here and there's no insulation. Insulation people come in here and they put the insulation here. And then this, there's no insulation in it. So we have, <clears throat> we have cold air that could infiltrate this, which means that we have, we have a suction of, of cold air that's wanting, you know, that's trying to pull warm air. Remember that warm air goes to cold air and it's, you know, it's like a big old suction. It just sucks it all, sucks the life out of us. If we've got air condition going on in here, the opposite is effect is gonna happen. So how can we improve on this? So by, by doing uh, a ladder type, there's a couple of different ways that you could do this. Uh, actually, one way, if we're using a two by four wall on the inside, so we've got our on center spacing studs through here <clears throat> and they don't matter where they go. We can take a, a larger two by, so this is a two by four wall and we can put a two by six in here sideways that's attached top and bottom. And then we have something that we can attach our stud for our intersecting wall here. And then we still have room that we can put drywall to it and we can insulate all the way through it. And I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to rush through this and I'll come back and talk about it a little bit more. I'm going to have to come back and talk about it a little bit more on Wednesday. So the other way is doing a ladder. So we have our own center stud spacing and we do a ladder. And so when I say that, this is what I mean by a ladder. We're doing, we're putting in these little bridges here so that we have something to attach the stud to. Therefore, we can get in there and put our insulation in behind that. Okay, we'll stop on that. I'll come back and we'll, we'll revisit the T's a little bit on Wednesday and then talk more about advanced framing uh, again on Wednesday. So guys, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day, rest of your day and a good day tomorrow. And I'll see you back here on Wednesday. Thank you.